Well, good morning and welcome to a brand new series today. We are going to dive right in and let me just tell you this, since Pastor Weston already stole what I was going to say for the opener of this service, what I'm believing God for, I, I, love, I love people who believe different things and different fellowships and different denominations, but I'm telling you, I, I am ordained with the Assemblies of God for several reasons and I am Assembly of God uh, like right after I am Bible-believing Christian. In fact, I'm Assembly of God because I'm a Bible-believing Christian. And I believe what God is doing in 67 million adherents across the globe through the Assemblies of God, U.S. and World Missions. And I am really excited to be a part of a church plant because there is no reason on earth that God shouldn't have an Assembly of God church of at least a thousand people in California. Capital City, Baton Rouge. And so we thank you for your prayers and your support. I shared this in first service. This was my prophecy. He could not steal this part. As I was praying for them in first service, I sensed in my heart very strong that the word pioneering was coming for this couple. That they're not just planting, but they are pioneering. And I know that's a word that goes along with church planning often, but I believe it's special for pastors being and Shelly Comer, that they are pioneering and plowing. And the next 20 months may be a little hard, but the Lord is going to, like he did Elijah, give you special strength to run ahead of all the hard things so that over the next 20 years, God can bring a harvest of health in Baton Rouge that would not have been if this couple wouldn't have answered the calling. Can you wake up and praise Jesus with me for just a minute if you believe that today? day. Hey, listen, if you love leadership, organizational, biblical, if you love personal development, you're going to love this series. If not, you need to embrace it anyway because Jesus sent you here. And I love it. And I believe, hear me, here's why I believe it's important. And I'm not talking about some self-help guru stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biblical leadership. You know the greatest leader that ever walked the face of the earth was Jesus, a carpenter's son from Nazareth, who was also, also fully God, the son of the father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we can learn a lot from the way that Jesus led and I believe, as you'll hear in this series, that the most important person that we lead is ourselves. Because when we don't lead ourselves, let me make it personal, when you don't lead yourself, you can't lead anybody else. It's why Jesus said, hey, first and most important commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And now you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you don't learn how to love yourself, then you'll never learn how to love somebody else. Because you don't know how to love God, you can't learn how to love the people that God created. But when, I'm preaching just right out of the box right here today, but when you learn how to love yourself the way that God loves you, when you learn how to see yourself the way that God sees you, when you learn how to lead yourself the way that Jesus wants to lead you, then God can use you to lead somebody then God can use you to love somebody then God will help you to see somebody the way that he sees them so leadership is important Luke chapter 21 Luke chapter 21 is where we ended last week verse 33 the series on values Jesus said this heaven and earth will disappear pass away uh, by the way even heaven as you know it currently uh, heaven that we know currently is not the place where we exist eternally. The heaven that we currently know is nothing more than a holding place for those who are in Christ. Jesus and everybody with him is coming back here. But the world as we know it is going to disappear. And the Bible says that God, after the current heaven and earth pass away, God will establish a new heaven, come on, a new earth, a new Jerusalem with a new people. So heaven and earth 
will pass away. We've been holding way too hard on to things that are going to disappear. Jesus said, but there's one thing you need to learn how to hang on to. Not just hear, because anybody can hear something. But he wants you to hear and hang on to it. In fact, that was the difference in whether the person was building their house on sand or stone. Everybody, a lot of people have heard the word of God. A lot of people just have a hard time holding on to the word of God. Specifically when things happen. So he says this, my words will never disappear. Verse 34, he says, wash out. And you'll hear just a little Latino accent when I say that because... I happen to have the opportunity to live with uh, multiple Latino individuals with a very strong accent. And then when they would ask my name, I would say Chris Fry. Well, they automatically associated, by the way, that's F-R-Y-E, because I'm from North Louisiana. I'm just letting you know, yeah, I got to pay for my own dry cleaning and everything. Okay, so <laughs> you only get that if you're from here. If you're watching from a distance, you don't, that'll make sense. Uh, but, but when I would tell them my name, when I would tell them my name, they would, oh, oh chicken fry? Like, no, because they would automatically fry with fried chicken. So they're like, oh, chicken fry? I'm like, no, Chris fry. Oh, yeah, you chicken fry. I'm like, no, whatever, chicken fry. And then they would always, we would play these little games. and We would kind of try to interpret one another. And then they would, they would always say, chicken fry, you better watch out. <laughs> so whenever I read watch out, I hear my friend from the minor league saying, chicken fry, you better watch out. They were listening to Jesus. It had nothing to do with the scripture, but I just thought it wake people up. Watch out. For what? For your heart to be troubled and weighed down. By what? Carousing, dissipation, revelry, drunkenness. Oh, well, Pastor, that's okay. I don't drink. Oh, no, no, hang on. You don't drink alcohol. Some of y'all do. <laughs> it's just too much. <laughs> it's, I'm not preaching that message today. The question is not what you're dr- whether you're drinking, it's what you're drinking. And I know people that get drunk on all kinds of things. They get drunk on their favorite series that Jesus died for. They get drunk on their favorite genre of music. I don't care what genre you listen to, but if Jesus shed his blood for it, you better turn it off. Because your ears and your eyes are the route to your heart. And some people are drunk on entertainment. Some people are drunk on athletics. Some people are drunk, drunk, I'm talking drunk on enlightenment and education. And I believe we should study to show ourselves approved. But we don't study to show ourselves identified. I believe we can be drunk on, some of y'all get drunk on social media. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. You spend way more time on Facebook than you ever do in his book. You wonder what's wrong with your spirit. You letting too much other things in it. Don't be drunk, weighed down by social media, mainstream media. He says, then Jesus just makes it simple. The cares of this life. Why? Because it's going to disappear. And if you do that, the day, that's, that's Jesus' return, the day will catch you unaware. And you'll end up just like the people you get all mad at. So what's important here? is that we understand that what we value affects how vulnerable we are or are not. I said this last week, without values, we're very vulnerable. And you can just look around. Look at the state of our nation. The lower our values, the higher our vulnerability. Think about a new business that comes into town or a, a, a new restaurant or a new building. Like when they first build it, everything's really nice. You know, they're like, welcome to Moe's. That was prophetic. Moe's, come to Eunice. (laughs) They're excited. It's clean. It's kept up. But within a month or two, you can identify the true values of the people in that place. Specifically, the ownership. Why? Because what you allow, you approve. And people of influence allow too many things. And so people who are being influenced think that they approve certain things. Woo, I'm getting deep today. Hang on. Because all of a sudden what was new and nice and exciting, within just a little time because of a lack of values, becomes very vulnerable. 
and businesses and locations and cities and communities and people who were at one time thriving are now barely holding on. Why? Because they lowered their values. And they became very vulnerable. A value, as we define terms throughout this series, a, a value is a person's principles or standards of behavior. I have said probably 30 times in the last five years that if you show me your behavior, I'll show you your belief. People will behave according to what they actually believe. Not what you say you believe. And then the Oxford Dictionary says a value is a person's principles or standards of behavior. So if you really believe God's word, then you will behave according to God's word. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Like if you learn how to love me the way I created you to love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because you love me. Like if you love an individual, you're not just going to intentionally hurt them. A value is one's judgment of what is important. I wanted to add the word actually important in life. If you want to practically, this, this series will be as practical as, it, as, as the Bible is powerful. Because God is both. He's not just powerful, he's practical, he's God. If you look back at the last three days, look at the last three days, maybe even just Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because Saturday, that's kind of hard to count. <laughs> but then Saturday may or may not have been some of your free time. So if you look back at the last few days, at what you invested in the most, I'm telling you right now, that's what's the most important to you. Where was Jesus? Where was your family? Where were your friends? Because all you have to do to know what is most important to you is look at what you invest in, and then you'll know. We heard recently as a staff, because we believe in investing in our leadership, because God has called us to lead we believe uh, we heard this and it fits that a value is actually the force that shapes a culture. A culture. Let me make, it, make this simple. It easily defined, simply defined. It's just practical terms because definitions are subjective anyways. A, a culture is just an unspoken atmosphere. Okay, I know I'm digging today. A, a culture is an unspoken atmosphere. In other words, when you walk into a convenience store... You don't even have to get all the way in to know whether that's where you want to use the bathroom or not. <laughs> Come on. Nobody had to say anything to you. You just walked in and you had a sense, maybe a spirit. You had a sense as to whether that is the place that you wanted to be. That's culture. It's an unspoken atmosphere when you pull onto a campus, Pastor Weston mentioned it. No, we probably don't need another church in Baton Rouge. Did we need another church in Eunice? No, about like we need another hole in our head. Some people need to sew the ones they got shut. All right, so <laughs> Did we need another church in Eunice? No, we needed a healthy church in Eunice. Because we don't predominantly minister to people who are unchurched. We predominantly minister to people who have been hurt by the church. And we needed to develop a culture, an unspoken atmosphere, that people could just drive by and go, Whoa! Something's happening there that I got to take my babies to. Something's happening there that I got to get inside of. Something's happening there that I want to be a part of. That's, that's culture. It's an unspoken atmosphere. You don't even have to say anything. It's why we believe in serving. It's why we have people opening doors and waving flags. And, and we got those little signs. I want to get one of them little dudes. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> why? Because when people drop by and says, hey, stop here. We want you. Unspoken atmosphere. 
If culture is an unspoken atmosphere, hear me, a value is the force that creates or suffocates that atmosphere. I can get in your vehicle and sense your culture and know your values. I can walk into your home and sense your culture and know your values. It's the force that creates that culture in your office, in your friendships. You, listen to me, you are supposed to have more effect on the atmosphere that God puts you in than the atmosphere has an effect on you. You are not a thermometer. You are a thermostat. You set the temperature for where the Holy Spirit sets you. That's our values. Every church, every organization, every home, every individual, we all need values. But watch this, these values have to be defined. They can't just be assumed. Because a, a, a value that is just assumed is easily ignored. In other words, if I just assume that my children know my values, they're going to ignore my values. My biological father told me that he believed that is, in, in essence, that's what happened in his house. That, that sometimes, possibly, my, my, my grandparents just assumed that they would know. Because, listen, if you're standing by my granddaddy when the trumpet sounds, you better grab his foot. You are standing by my nana when the trumpet of the Lord... Like I heard, I heard Pastor Cordell say this yesterday about his mother-in-law. I thought it was hilarious. He was like, he, he watched Left Behind in a, in a state of being that maybe or maybe not he should have or shouldn't have been in. And, and so if he was ever worried about whether the rapture happened, he just looked for his mother-in-law. I'm telling you right now, if you wanted to know whether God had caught the saints up in the air, you just look around for Nana. As long as Nana's still there, you're still safe. Nana's clothes are laying on the ground. I walked into Nana's house one time. She had just changed her clothes. They were laying on the ground. I was like, oh, Jesus. No, it's, it's not even true. I just made that up right now. <laughs> but your values have to be defined. Because if you just assume that somebody knows your values, then they will ignore your values. They will assume that you are approving something you're not approving. Why? Because we have to communicate expectations. This is just, it's, it's like leadership 101. You know where this is the most amusing? Because Megan and I, Pastor Weston, Kelsey, Pastor Dylan, Sierra, and our staff in general, we meet with a lot of people who are like, already married or about to be married or have been married for a while. And, and you would be amazed at how many wives or about to be wives think that their husbands are supposed to know what they're thinking and what they want. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me help you. <laughs> we don't know! <laughs> I have no... I love it, but I have no idea what's going on in that thing. And God, uh, hey, by the way, when I think I do, I'm wrong. <laughs> hey, I know it's cute in Hollywood, right? It's a fairy tale. Oh, he just knows my thoughts. We finish each other's sandwiches. So it's, <laughs> it's no, better keep your hands off my sandwich, girl. I will make you your, I will buy you a loaf of sandwich. Eating my sandwich. Look, that's not reality. You know what's reality? Not understanding one another if we're not taking time to have conversations with one another. Trying to hold people to expectations that we haven't communicated? You're setting that person up for failure. You have to tell, well, if I tell them it's not as special. Says who? That's not in the book, y'all. I'm just letting you know. No, no, no. Here, it's, it's actually more special that you would tell somebody what you are thinking, what you are desiring, and what you are wanting 
and they learn who you are, and then they begin to minister to your desire, your heart, your expectation over theirs. God, that's what God gave us his word for. He's saying, hey, here's what I expect. And then this is what the, the beautiful thing about our relationship with Jesus is that we begin, instead of doing what we wanted to do, we begin to do what he wanted us to do, and then he begins to give us new things that we never even thought of, and that's marriage. Communicate expectations. Because we cannot hold people to expectations that they do not know. No one will ever hear me listen no one will ever live up to an expectation that you have not had a conversation with them about. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 21 says this. In the English Standard Version, the lips of the righteous feed many. In other words, like, we begin to understand one another. We can have conversations. We can have discussions. But fools... Fools die for a lack of sense. Fools die because, because righteous people didn't say anything. Fools' relationships die because the righteousness of God and the expectations of the spouse weren't properly communicated. Either that or they were only selfishly communicated. Proverbs 25, 11, New Living Translation, it says this, timely advice is lovely. Timely advice is lovely. When you think you've said something a hundred times, say it one more time. Because when you've said something a hundred times, somebody just heard it for the first time. <laughs> I feel like in my house, I say the same things a lot. A what? I'm not talking about you, girl. Hang on. I'm talking about our babies. She like, yeah, me too. <laughs> Shut the cabinets. This is not the sweet spot. This is the floor. Put your clothes in the basket. All right. <laughs> but when I say something for the first, like a hundred times, I'm telling you, I have an almost 11-year-old that it's going to register with for the first time. It's like, you know what's really annoying? is when you guys come to me, like we bring in a guest speaker, and they preach this message, and they say things, and then you come up to me like, did you hear when he said, da 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 Did you hear when she said, blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, yeah, that was awesome. I think I might have said the same God-blessed thing over the last few months. But I'm glad you finally heard it. <laughs> Timely wisdom is like, in my, in my online only, I, I said green apples. <laughs> it's like golden apples in a silver basket. You can have my golden apples. I, I, I'll take regular apples. But you understand the purpose. Timely advice. As a staff, as a staff, we understand how important these three things are. You ready? This is for your life. Vision, mission, values. This is for you personally. This is for your family. Vision is your why. It's very simple. Mission, mission is your what. Values are your how. So when, so when I, I set in to something that I get to lead next week with leaders across the state, and Pastor Den Hussey said, you need to know why God sent you to your church, okay? But, but not just that. Not just do you need to know why God sent you to your church. You need to know why your church exists. And he said, that's your vision. And if you don't know that, then you can't communicate it. So you need to get along with God before you do anything else and you need to figure out why God puts you here and why there's a church in your city. And so I came home and I started praying. I was like, Lord, why'd you send us to Eunice? Why, bigger than, why is New Hope in Eunice? 
And then I, I heard this little phrase. It wasn't audible voice. I just heard this little phrase to meet people. And I was like, meh. <laughs> you know, because I wanted something like super spiritually powerful, like drop down from heaven. And I was like, really? Meet people. He said, yeah, how many people have you met since you've been here? That's why it's so important to Pastor Ben and Shelly that you send them some. They want to meet people. They don't want to build a building. They want to build people. So they want to meet people. And then I heard this little phrase, and grow closer to God together. Why? Because that's, way, that's the way that you were created to grow. Small groups are so important. The first thing that God dealt with, what? Loneliness. He said to Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. I didn't create you to be alone. I created you to be part of a body. I created you to be, so, be, be a part of something bigger than yourself. And so our vision at this church is to meet people and grow closer to God together. I'm the only person that could figure that out because God put me in the position of being in charge. Now, God's in control, but he put me in charge. I couldn't let anybody else do that. Let me give you a biblical example. Remember that time that Moses sent 12 other people to get a vision for the entire nation of Israel that God had actually positioned him to share with them? He sent 12 spies. Go spy out in the land. Come back and give us a report. Mo I don't think Moses was supposed to do that. Because those, came, those 12 guys came back divided on the vision that God had for those people. I think Moses was supposed to go out. It's just, I'm not saying it's a biblical absolute. But God positioned that leader. Listen, you're the leader of your home. God put you in your office. God put you in your classroom. God put you in your vehicle. God put you in that relationship, that friendship, that marriage. Well, yeah, but you don't know what they're doing. Look, I don't care what the Canaanites are doing. You're still called. You have a vision. And only you can communicate the vision. The mission is, is, is what? This is what we're going to do. We, we set it up. We actually adopted that from somebody else. I can't adopt vision from somebody. I've got to hear from, I gotta hear from God for vision. Without vision, people cast off restraint. But now we have a mission. Okay. Let me fast forward because we'll get into this more as we go. Why vision, why we do what we do is only as strong as how we do it. Maybe I could say it's only as valuable as how we do it. So watch this. A lapse of integrity will lead to a lapse of influence. I won't say the name because I didn't ask for permission, but I've heard the story and, and, and that person will share the story. But I, I personally know a very talented, charismatic individual who at one point had an international ministry. International. An international evangelistic ministry. Headed to be the next as big of a name as anybody could be. And yet, even though he had sung in Madison Square Garden, and he had been on the stage at T.D. Jake's church, yet he had some integrity issues that nobody knew about. That's why we're so always saying, hey, listen, you, you, it would be better to confess now than to pay for eternity. Because there is no thing, which, no thing hidden which shall not be revealed. Because a lapse of integrity will lead to a loss of influence immediately. International evangelistic minister immediately. As soon as those issues of morality were exposed and the devil will wait until it costs you the most to expose you. He will let you get away with it until the point. He will let you get... This is how you know that you're walking with Jesus. If he exposes you every time you try to do something stupid, <laughs> that's Jesus. And he, this person rose, and, and God was using him in a great way, but his issues and morality rose to the surface, and immediately, immediately, he lost his influence. So much to the fact, and this is his story, not mine, again, so much to the fact that one of his daughters, when it all came out and not everything had taken place because of a lack of values and accountability, 
She took a t-shirt that said, Daddy loves you. And she took a Sharpie and she scribbled out Daddy and cut it into pieces. She's like, I'm ripping your heart out. I'm telling you, it's not worth it to lower your values. It's not worth it to sleep together before you get married and not be in holy matrimony. It's not, it's not worth it to find unhealthy fulfillment in places that you're not supposed to be finding unhealthy fulfillment. Now hear me, hear me, because I, there, there are people that have been through these things and are going through those things. God has restoring, is restoring that person today. And God can restore you and he can restore your children and your children's children and your family. But you need to understand that it would be way better to carry the burden of conviction and crucify that desire in the moment than it would be to carry the burden of the consequence of submitting to that desire. This is how important values are. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says, We are careful to be honorable before the Lord. But we also want everyone else to see that we are honorable. This is not just about pleasing God. Now, I'm not saying that you should be a people pleaser. It's not what I'm saying at all. And you still serve for an audience of one. But listen to me. God anointed you for influence, not just for him in heaven. He anointed you for influence for him on earth. I know it's simmering. It, it, it feels like a gumbo in here. This is why we have the air down so low. <laughs> and you're letting this, hey, look, let this get in your heart. Carry this burden a little bit. That is, this is why the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit didn't just come so that you could be more honorable with the Lord. No, no, no. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait because the Holy Spirit will come upon you and He will empower you to be an example for everyone else. Not so that you can just be honorable before God, but so that you can be honorable before people. So your integrity should always stay ahead of your influence. It's why I'm asking incessantly for people to give me like constructive criticism and, and, and my wife to hold me accountable and ask me the tough questions because I don't want an area of my life that the devil can hide in. Like I don't want a shadow that I can keep secret because it is only a matter of time until the enemy tears down that wall and the light shines on that shadow. Are you with me? Be honorable before the Lord, but we also want to be honorable before others because values are essential. So this is our only number one today. You ready? These are our new hope values. This is where it starts. By the way, everything starts with Jesus. Everything. Everything. Delight in Jesus. I'm going to explain it in a minute. Let me give you a 30-second side note. Our number one value in our home for our marriage and for our children, number one, number one is that they would know Jesus. Because if I can connect them to Jesus, then it doesn't matter who the enemy surrounds them with. I am currently, I am a general preparing three soldiers for battle in a society that does not want to hear his name. I've got seven years left with my old, seven years to prepare a soldier for battle. She needs to know and understand, believe in her heart, that the most important thing in our home is not where we live, what we live in, who our friends are, or how much we get along with one another. The most important thing in our house is that we know Jesus. I don't want to just connect her to good principles. Come on, I want to connect her to a good father. Delight in Jesus. In our home, it's no Jesus. Through this series, I'll give you the ones that we have for our church and the ones that we have in our home. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I have heard, <laughs> I have heard this scripture misquoted several times. Okay? 
I've heard like, now it's fun. Like it's fun to me. The Lord said, if you delight in him, <laughs> then he will give to you. No, hang on. This is not about you. Jesus didn't come so that your deceitfully wicked heart could get everything it wants. Delight yourself in the Lord. What does this word mean? In the original Hebrew, delight means soften. Soften. Let me give you a visual. So instead of a stone, when you pour water on a stone, it just runs right off, dries right up. Come on. But when you soften yourself in the Lord, then you become like a sponge. And come on, when you pour water on a sponge... It doesn't just run back off. No, no, no. It washes on and out of the sponge what was there and begins to fill the sponge with the things that he has. So the Bible said when you soften or you become delicate, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may lift you up. In due time is very important right there because he will only lift you up if that's where he can use you. If he can't use you up, come on, he'll let you stay down. Because he's more interested in your soul than your satisfaction. I need to say that in the third service. (laughs) Delight yourself, if you'll put that back up there. Delight yourself in the Lord. And then he will give... Give, that word doesn't mean like he gonna, he's going to like give you everything that was already there. That word is literally translated Hebrew to put in. To put in you the desires of your heart. So here's what it's saying. When you soften yourself before God, you become like a sponge. And now God can put everything that he has for you in that heart and instead of being fulfilled by the temporary and the earthly you will begin to be fulfilled by the transformational and the eternal that's who he is and listen i'm telling you if you follow jesus if you want to follow jesus i can almost promise you he will do to you what he did to me and he will purge you of everything and everybody that you thought you needed He will purge you of everything, or he'll ask you to give it to him. Like that time he asked us to liquidate everything that we had, leave $200 in our savings account, and give it all to the church. Now, you better make sure that's Jesus. (laughs) Or like that time my stepdaddy contracted a brand new house for me, and we lived in it for three months. Three months. And within a couple of months, we lived, lived, moved into a shotgun church parsonage. I don't know if you've ever lived in a church parsonage. This one was decent. But I could, i let you, let me just give you a visual. <laughs> Maybe not a visual. i just let you know, I could do what I needed to do in the restroom all at the same time. Turn on the sink, flush the toilet, and get the water, try the shower ready all at once. I'm like, just stand, I ain't even got to move. It's all right. There. And God will purge you of everything that you think you need in order to show you what he actually has for you. Max Lucado painted this picture. He talked about a fish on a beach. If you take a fish out of the ocean and you put him on the beach, if you give him this great chair to sit in underneath the sun, is the fish happy? If you pour him a drink, you know, like a spritzer without the intoxication you give him a whole ice chest full of his favorite cherry vanilla coke zero i'm just saying you have yours i have mine don't judge me you like high fructose corn syrup i like aspartame it doesn't matter you give the fish you give the fish his favorite drink card to swamp nutrition is the fish happy If you take Floyd Mayweather's backpack, Floyd Mayweather's a little boxer. You see him coming down the road, bap, you catch him off guard. He didn't dodge you, okay? You take his backpack, you give it to the fish. There's a million dollars in Floyd Mayweather's backpack because he thinks that's what his value is found in. 
You give that to the fish. This fish has everything he needs right there on the beach. Is he happy? No. Why? Because you can have everything that this world has to offer and still suffocate. Why? Because you weren't created for this world. Your value is not found in this society. So let me say this. Lower your expectation of earth. As we come in for a landing, lower your expectation of this earth. And by the way, even the people in it. Coach Jeff Willis told me this. I'll never forget it. He said, never put, never put your faith and your trust in something that can be taken away. Lower your expectation of this life. Hear me, look. But raise your expectation of the life that God has for you. And the reason that he's put you here. And what he has for you for eternity, not just here on earth. Guys, eternity is way longer than earth. We're going to be with Jesus way longer than we've been with one another. And we have to lower our expectation. Listen to me. There's not a new car. There's not a new city. There's not a new person. There's not a new boyfriend, new girlfriend, new spouse. Anything that is outside of this word is not from God. It's from the devil, and you better beware. There's not a new toy. There's not a, 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 a new accomplishment. There's not a test that you can complete. Come on, there's not a class you can finish or a project you can be done with. You cannot find your fulfillment in what you get done. Hi, I'm Chris. It's a daily struggle for me. No, no. You find your fulfillment in who you are. Why? Because stuff doesn't satisfy. Two scriptures. Psalm 38, 4. Sorry, correction. I wrote it wrong in the bulletin. It's Psalm 34, 8. I sang it yesterday. Oh, taste and see. It's an incredible song, artist Shane and Shane. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is he who hides in him. Come on, when you taste and see what God has for you, you'll stop chasing after all the junk that the enemy of this life has for you. And then God can give you, put in you. Psalm 97, 12, it says it this way. May all who are godly be happy in the Lord and praise and praise His holy name. Right here, come on, this is like the wrap up. This is important. Praise His holy name name you were created in the image and for the glory of god why are we having a worship night tonight because we were bored and didn't have anything else to do are you nuts no 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 we're having a worship night tonight to kick off seven days of fasting and prayer why are we doing fasting and prayer because i needed to make sure that my midsection was more trim from all the junk i've been eating no i hate fasting why are we going to get up at 6 o'clock and come here and, and, and pray for six, at 6.30 in the morning every day this week? And we're inviting you to join us in a week of fasting and prayer and hoping more than three people show up every morning. Why? Because we believe that delighting in Jesus is the most fulfilling and valuable thing that you could ever do in your life. How many minutes... Did you spend worshiping Jesus last week versus how many hours you spent doing other things? Now, I'm not saying you can't worship Jesus through other things. But how did you worship Him last week? How will you worship Him this week? If that's what we were really created for, then isn't that what we should invest in the most? Those who praise His holy name. Those are the ones who will be fulfilled. Those are the ones who will not be left wanting. That's why we're here. We're fasting for the fall. 
I had to correct Pastor Lydia. This is not the fall fast. It's August, y'all. Keep your pumpkins in your attic. <laughs> Equinox ain't till September. We Googled it. <laughs> it is not fall. And Christmas either. We'll talk about that in October. It's a crazy people. I'm trying to eat at Thanksgiving. Y'all trying to decorate for Santa. He, never mind. Almost messed up. I want to invite, here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to close. I want to invite you. Even if you can't come tonight, we get that. I love the story my wife told. She's rocking Gabriel. It's a tough season. Young mama, three babies. Six hours away from her family. Two and a half at that time. Rocking at, at about 11 o'clock at night. Apologizing to Jesus for not spending any time with him recently. And she heard that still small voice. Do you not think that you're honoring me right now? This is your greatest ministry. Remember Jesus said, whatever you do in my name. Just don't get so distracted. And by the way, if you can't do it in Jesus' name, then you better stop doing it. Or, or don't start it. Because it is really easy to stop what you don't start. Come on. So here's what I offer. Worship God today. Come back tonight. We're going to have songs and we're going to worship Jesus together. That's all it's going to be. It's no message. We're just going to worship God together. And then, and then decide this afternoon, Lord, what do I need to fast? What do I need to lay down so I can lean in? I'm not saying don't, don't do anything but drink water for the next seven days. That's not what I'm saying. That's between you and Jesus. Maybe you need to eat clean. Maybe you need to get off social media. I don't know what you need to do. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. And I trust God's sovereignty for you. If you take the time, He will tell you just as He's told me. If you won't be so easily distracted. I want you to join us this week. Seven days. Fasting and prayer. Come on, as we believe God to send missionaries to the greatest mission field in the United States of America, which is the public school system college campuses we can't whine about what God called us to win come on we're going to fast and pray and we're going to prepare for this fall believe God for a mighty harvest why? because only Jesus can fulfill your desire no thing and no one else only I'm telling you I'm telling you you don't need to hear my personal testimony today. Only Jesus can fulfill you. Would you bow your head with me today as we let God speak? I pray the Holy Spirit would just sweep this room and I pray that he would sweep your room if you're listening online, live or later. Ask him right now, before you go anywhere, Lord, what do I need to lay down? Seven days, what, what, what can I fast? What can I disconnect from? How can I grow closer to you this week? Lord, I trust you to speak. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying right now. Help us to know you and make you known. God, I pray right now for anybody in this room that doesn't know you that hasn't been delighting in you. Who's been trying to live their life their way and has been left wanting. Come on, if that's you this morning, I, I, I wanna invite you. The church is praying for you right now. We had 20 people here at 6.30 this morning praying for you. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, I wanna invite you to open your hands right where you are. Just posture yourself. You don't have to raise them. It doesn't have to be a big deal. This is about the prayer that you pray and the confession that you make with God. This is between you and Him. 
right now, if that's you, if the Holy Spirit's stirring in you, I want you to consider giving your life to Jesus and never taking it back again. Open your hands right where you are. Church, I want to invite you to support them in prayer so that they know they're not alone. Come on, we're going to pray out loud together. We're going to confess, proclaim with our mouth because I believe that's where the power is found according to God's Word. Come on, let's pray it together. Jesus, forgive me where I'm distracted, where I invest in too many different things where I've sinned and fallen short. I believe you gave your life so I could live for you. You died on the cross. You shed your blood. You paid for my sin. But you were raised from the dead so I could be born again and made new. So may I follow you with all of my heart in every area from this day forward I surrender all right now in Jesus name Amen if you believe in that prayer can you give him praise today hey before you gather your things I believe this is one of the most important things that we do if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time would you please let us know just text us text us I believe 84576 I believe 845 Seven six, and we'll connect with you send you an email follow up with you God help us very quickly finally if you're a guest with us today uh, I don't want you to feel any pressure from any other aspect of our service the only other thing that we want from you is that you would take the time to fill out a connect card